trying to keep track of the general media and left-wing political narrative on riots and looting and overall destruction of American cities is becoming a nearly impossible task. The logic is strapped in a straitjacket and bouncing off the padded walls. It's like watching Happy Gilmore's final putt. First, and still in some cases, it was denial. Something between, oh, the riots are overstated or improperly characterized. They're mostly peaceful protests. And the riots are an outright myth. That's a myth that's being spread only in Washington, D.C. Now they're shifting to, okay, the riots are real and they're bad, but they're Trump's fault. And they won't stop until that orange menace disavows like the heroic Joe Biden did. But also, the riots are real and kinda sorta good, or at least understandable and defensible. You got NPR highlighting one author's argument in defense of looting. After all, the very basis of property as a concept is whiteness and black oppression. NPR loots your tax dollars to defend the looting of the rest of your property. You know, if we can't find common ground on some basic moral truths, maybe we can find some common ground on defunding a few things. But that's a topic for another day. Today, I'll focus on this looting defense. It's one you'll find in this piece, and one you've heard throughout the summer of chaos and destruction. Oh, what's the big deal? Looting is just about property. It's not lives. It's not actually hurting people. Property is replaceable and stores are insured. Who cares if we're only hurting insurance companies? Oh, it's only the insurance companies we're hurting. I'm sorry, is there an insurance company exception to basic morality and common decency? What about being an insurance company justifies theft? And if that theft is justified, well, why don't we all grab our masks and our common sense guns and go rob every state farm office in sight? What would be wrong about doing that if it's only the insurance companies we'd be hurting? But even regardless of the morality of it, this argument is just plain wrong on its points of fact. Ooh, violently destroying property doesn't put anyone's lives at risk. Oh, really? Why don't you tell that to the mystery body discovered two months later in the Minneapolis wreckage, charred so badly they still don't even know who it is. Tell that to the guy in the coma after a statue toppled on his face. Tell that to the family of David Dorn or the families of dozens of other people dead as a result of the summer of love. So it's not just about things. It is, in fact, about people's lives. But even if property is just things and things aren't important, why then do you spend so much time bemoaning the distribution of things and how oppressive and unfair that structure is? Property is just stuff. Also, income inequality is a problem. Pick one. But more to the point, just because a property owner paid an insurance company to accept risks against that property doesn't make you justified in making those risks a reality. Just because you have car insurance doesn't mean I get to key your car. Just because you have life insurance doesn't mean I get to murder you. And the same is true for ransacking a store. There's a fundamental immorality there that exists independent of whether someone is insured against it or not. And even if the financial compensation of an insurance company somehow erased that moral wrong committed, the damage done is, of course, much worse and much more complicated than that simple transaction can correct. Even if the insurance payout matched dollar for dollar with the damage done, guess whose insurance costs just went up? That business and every other property owner on that block and in that neighborhood. It's a less obvious form of additional theft. You're not just destroying property in the present, you are stealing from that property owner in the future costs he now has to cover. And of course, in practice, the payout is never dollar for dollar anyway. An insurance policy is a carefully crafted legal document with all sorts of qualifications on what is covered and for how much money. Your insurance coverage of 50 grand doesn't save you if the mob has torched you for millions. Anyone who's ever made an insurance claim knows those hoops and that dance, but in case you don't have that experience, that is exactly what's playing out on the ravaged streets of the Twin Cities of Minnesota today. Oh, who cares? It's just property and insurance companies. They'll just rebuild. Will they? Is the money there to do that? And more importantly, will they actually want to do that. Those questions are the biggest obstacles to restoring Minneapolis and St. Paul. And the way things are looking, you're talking years, if ever. Because don't forget, before rebuilding time, it's still cleanup time. And more than three months after the blocks of the Twin Cities were torched and otherwise destroyed after the George Floyd incident, 
The mess remains. There are still obstacles to tearing down the old destroyed bricks before they can even lay any new ones. Local coverage in the Star Tribune profiles several area business owners and their struggles simply to take out the trash. Consider Jay Kim, the owner of the Sports Dome Retail Complex in St. Paul. The property was so badly damaged it was unsalvageable. A safety hazard the city sent a crew to demolish because it was dangerously unstable. Well, good. So now the insurance company pays out and... Everything's even and Jay starts rebuilding and we all move on, right? No, of course not. Now the city sends him a bill for $140,000 and his insurance company directs him to his policy fine print, which specifies very clearly he's covered for only twenty five grand in demolition costs. Because one, nobody really expects to have to just destroy an entire building on a moment's notice, and two, because simply smashing something down and hauling it away is not usually, and not necessarily, a hugely expensive job. And that's why most commercial insurance policies are covering between 25 and 50 grand, according to this piece. But Jay's bill isn't actually uncommon. In fact, he may be comparatively lucky. According to the Star Trib, demolition contractors have been submitting bids in excess of two or three hundred thousand dollars. So why the discrepancy? Why the astronomical costs? Well, because government has swooped in to save the day yet again. The demolition contractors agree the costs are high, but the reason they are is because government regulation requires these contractors to treat all debris from a burned out building as hazardous. That means specialized equipment. That means restrictive safety protocol and a specialized skill set for workers. And that, of course, means higher prices. Following restrictive government rules has increased cost for already victimized property owners. There's no way to argue around it, but the Minneapolis City Council will try. Council Vice President Andrea Jenkins says this is price gouging. This is a symbol of capitalism run amok. Okay, so you make the work tougher to do, and you limit who can do it and how, and then you're shocked when there are fewer people available to do the work, but demand remains, so prices skyrocket. Well, there's clearly only one solution here. We gotta get the attorney general involved and create an even tighter government grip, says the council VP. We gotta crack down on these price gougers and the systemic oppression of minorities, says the government, as they drastically increase prices and oppress minorities. Remember, that's the narrative in the NPR piece. Property is merely a construction of whiteness. Thus, the looting is justified. Well, take note of the names of these agents of white supremacy mentioned in the Star Trib piece. There's a Native American woman. There's an Indian restaurant owner. There's an Ethiopian immigrant who sold furniture in an immigrant neighborhood, all of whom had their businesses destroyed and all of whom are trying to restore their property, not because they've been indoctrinated with white constructs, but because they believe they have a moral responsibility and obligation to restore their community from war zone to prosperity, even if that effort drains them financially dry. And that's admirable precisely because these aren't just things. These are people's lives lives they've worked decades to build, and not just for the benefit of themselves, but for the benefit of every other life around them too. But even the greatest ambition and moral calling and commitment to community has its limits. There are practical and logistical considerations. If you are literally rebuilding from the ground up, well, that means you have an opportunity to pick some new ground. So why would any reasonable and productive person choose to stay on this unstable ground? Why would anybody trying to build anything sign up for this arrangement where the government neglects its one job of protecting your rights and allows your property to be destroyed and then saddles you with an insurmountable bill to clean up the mess? I understand loyalty to your city, but every loyalty has a betrayal too far. I can't imagine rationalizing this one. That's part of the reason buildings are still piles of rubble today, after being piles of rubble for months, with plenty more months of rubble in the forecast. And each of those rubble piles, and each of those months, corresponds to another opportunity lost for the very people for whom these riots were supposed to be fighting. Yeah, but who cares about opportunity, right? Opportunity is just a path to property anyway, and property is just stuff. Before I sign off, I have to address one small change in my videos that assuredly will be noticed if I don't say anything. I can't use the old outro music anymore because the person who made that music has decided 
He can't in good conscience associate with my videos anymore. Seriously speaking, please do not try to contact this person in any way. I'm obviously disappointed by the decision, but his property and association rights are just as valid as anybody else's. I share this information only out of respect for you, the audience, so you can understand the changes, not out of any sort of aggression toward him. So that move leaves me searching for a new music offering with which to leave you each and every episode. I'll pick something good soon, but for now, I'll just use something more suitable for the times. Thanks, as always, for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below, and especially over on Twitter. That is at ML Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chatting my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Goodbye.